Willkommen. Welcome. Today's talk will be given in English, but first we'll have a short introduction in Norwegian. Willkommen til denne strømmingen fra Nasjonalmuseet for kunst, arkitektur og design. Og i dag er vi inne fra Nasjonalgalleriet i Oslo, og denne gangen er vi i studiesalen for grafikk og tegning. I kveld skal vi bli bedre kjent med en figur mange vil huske fra skolebøkene, nemlig Pesta og Svartedown-serien til Tredje Kittelsen. Sendingen vil bli publisert med norsk tekst i etterkant, siden hele denne serien foregår på engelsk. Det er mulig å stille spørsmål på norsk og engelsk underveis i kommentarfeltet, og vi vil forsøke å besvare disse etter foredraget er ferdig. Welcome to this live stream from Nasjonalmuseet. Today we are once again back at the National Gallery in Oslo, ready to give you a close encounter with one of our most popular artworks from the collection. This evening, curator Maeve Litveit and paper conservator Tina Grette Paulsson will be talking about Theodor Kittelsen's The Black Death series. It is possible to ask questions in the comment section below, and we will strive to answer these after the talk. Over to you, Mayfri, Tina, and Pesta. Thank you. thank you, Maria, and thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, here in this close encounter with Theodor Kittelsen. As Maria said, we are now in the prints and drawings study room of the old National Gallery building, unfortunately closed to the public at the moment. Uh, Mayfrid will start your encounter by, with Kittelsen by telling you a bit about both the artist and his work. Yes, but first I will just give you a sh some short information about, about the collection. We have about 50,000 works on paper on art, prints and drawings from the end of the 15th century un until today. Among these we have close to 300 drawings by Kittelsen, included those related to the Black Death series. These drawings have a unique place in Norwegian illustration and art history and are regarded as a central part of our common Norwegian cultural heritage. In general, drawings that are made as a basis for book illustrations represent an important field in the collection. For sure, the digital pictures cannot replace the experience of studying the original drawings close at hand, but we'll do our best to show you both the ori originals and some of their many interesting details via the screen. The next hour, we will take a closer look at Theodor Kittelsen and his work as an illustrator, especially with the series The Black Death or Den Sorte Död, as he called it in his ver first version of the title page, as you can see on the screen now. The reason for his first title probably goes back to an old legend by the priest and folklorist Andreas Feier, published in 1833. This was one of the main sources concerning inspiration for Kittelsen. In addition to the title page, there are 12 full page illustrations, several minor text illustrations, and a lot of smaller vignettes, altogether 45 drawings. In our collection, we have 32, and 19 of these were acquired last year from a private collector. And the 12 large drawings were sold to the National Gallery from Kittelsen's youngest son, Helge Kittelsen, in 1982. Yes, Tina, are we all now fed up with the pandemic scenarios? In real life, I guess the answer to this is yes. A year ago, few of us imagined that this dark theme should be that relevant for all of us. No, we really didn't. Still, we hope we can leave our own situation for a little while and have a deep dive into Kittilsen's book project 120 years ago. Yes. The first edition of The Black Death was published in Christiania at Stenersen in 1900. And the following year, the rights were sold to another publisher, Tvette Forlag, and a new edition was published. So after Dowen has death as a running theme, relevant and timeless, a kind of memento mori, a reminder of the inescapable death, with the landscape as frame reference for the theme. And the figure, female figure Pesta, she plays the main character. We will introduce you closer to her later. 
So I think now, before uh, telling us more about PESTA, you have to rewind a little bit, Neufried, to tell us something about um, Kittelsen in the late 19th century. Yes. Uh, where we'll see what inspired him and what was he working on before he started this Black Death project. Mm, yes. Let's go back to when it all began. The self-portrait, as you can see on the screen, is dated 1888, some years before he started the work with the Black Death series. He then lived in Lofoten, in the northern parts of Norway, where he was deeply inspired both by nature and culture. He lived with his sister and brother-in-law, who worked as a lighthouse keeper, keeper at Skomva Lighthouse. Kittelsen made a lot of drawings during his stay in Lofoten a selection of which ended up in two books, Lofoten 1 and 2, as you can see on the table. They were published in 1819 and 91. This was the start of a period intensively working with different book projects, most of them including both his own text and drawings. So it all started in Lofoten. The Lofoten books were followed by Trollskap in 1892 and his series from Jomfruland in 1893. However, he didn't succeed in publishing the last one. The drawings from this series are filled with happiness, poetic poems and lyrical mood, depicting the bright side of li life in sharp contrast to his next project, The Black Death. A few years later, he made a new drawing of the landscape from Lofoten, and Pesta was added to the motif, as you can see in the middle on the screen. And this became one of the full-page illustrations for the Black Death series. In 1904, he made a third version, as you can see here, in color, in color this time, and in larger scale probably meant to be reproduced as a color lithograph. This was one of his popular motifs and um, a possible source for extra income to support his large family. So around 1890, when Kit Ilsen uh, started realizing his ideas on the Black Death, he was no longer living in Lofoten, but in Skåte, who, uh, which is um, a small island outside Kragerø in the southern parts of Norway. Uh, what do you think inspired him, Meifrid, to create a book about such a gloomy project? Hmm. Yes. His previous works were not quite as dark. No, a very good question. <laughs> if we have a quick look at the two drawings you can see on the screen, they are in private ownership. Um, they witnessed that he, he started to, to play with this ID already when he lived in, at Skåte. And these two small drawings are related to the final illustration, which Tina shows now, called Desolation. And this is the one that ended up as a full page illustration. You also find the figure of Pesta in Kittelsen's book, The Book of Obli Oblivion, published in 1892. In The Black Death, Kittelsen reuses part of this motif for the introductory poem Autumn Night. He keeps the building, but cuts away Pesta. This was probably the first time he visualized the Pesta figure. He used their own house at Skåte, transforming the idyllic place into the mood of the Black Death using contemporary farm buildings didn't disturb him. As always, the nature was his main source for inspiration. And I find it quite contradictor contradictory that it was in the calm and idyllic landscape outside Kagre that he started to think about illustrating the Black Death. You're right, Tina, in pointing out the contrast between his Jom Fulan series and this one, really. I also think it's a good example on his complex mind, which definitely had place for the bright side of life as well. The drawings from Jom Fulan show the lyricist and nature poet on his best. So we have seen that nature was a definite source of, inf of inspiration for Kittelsen. Were there any other um, current thoughts or events that could have inspired him, do you think? 
Yes, uh, the book um, Black Death was created in a time characterized by international disquietness with new <coughs> knowledge about the plague bacteria and danger of infection in people's mind. The cholera ravaged about in Europe and other parts of the world. Precautions for preventing infection were established, including in Norway. And these quarantine provisions probably saved our country from a cat catastrophe at that time. Assuming that Kittelsen was well aware of news concerning the cholera epidemic, he was also inspired by currents within art and literature. The new romanticism focusing on anxiety, dark and threatening drives, including the dangerous woman, La Femme Fatale, who we know from, for example, Edvard Munch's Vampire. Kittelsen's Huldra, the ethereal mermaids from Jomfulan, and the witch figure from Trollskap can also be related to this theme. So you've mentioned now several of Kittelsen's book works, so it seems he was working a lot of illustration. Was this uh, common among artists in Norway at the time? Yes, compared to other countries in Europe, the tradition of book illustration was very young in our country. It started blooming with the publishing of illustrated folktale books in the years from 1879 to 87. And this project was led by the folktale collector Peter Christen Asbjørnsen, and Kittelsen was among the famous Norwegian artists who illustrates the Norwegian folk tales. These books were followed by the large project illustrating the Middle Age sagas of the Norse kings by Snorre Sturlason. A new special edition was published in 1899. Together, they, these two projects were milestones in the building of a specific Norwegian identity, and they still keep their position. Norwegian identity building was important at that time, as the union with Sweden was coming to its final years, ending in 1905. In the Middle Age history, Snorre got a new Norwegian translation, and it was illustrated by some of the most well-known Norwegian artists. Kittelsen was not among those. He was asked, but for some reason he refused. Probably he felt unwillingness to work as part of a team led by powerful artists as Erik Wernschel and Gerhard Munte. I think he preferred to work independent before adjusting to tight frames. At the same time, he made drawings for another book, Helle Olav, a related history to the sagas by Snorres. Although Helle Olav was not considered as a successful book, he continued, apparently undisturbed, with his next project, The Black Death. It makes sense now to keep this information in mind when uh, mm. Mayfried tells us uh, mm -hmm. the following uh, story, because now we are really getting into the Black Death and Pesta for real. We know a lot of you wonder who was this woman Kittelsen called Pesta? Mm. Yes, have a look at her. Kittelsen was fascinated by the old Norwegian folk legends, as I told you, collected by Andreas Faye. And Faye tells, among other things, a story about an old, scary woman which definitely inspired Kittelsen, an old, pale woman. In another old story told from generation to generation in the neighborhood where Kittelsen grew up, the female beggar Helene Brua from Sannidal went from farm to farm with her two children, begging and spreading the infection. She was a historical person, we know for sure because it was documented by the contemporary doctor in Kagere. In the neighborhood at Skåtøy, Kittelsen met an old woman, reminding him about the old legend, and some years after he memorized. She was small, lean and bent, her face greenish-yellow with black spots. Her eyes were squinting, dark and restless, and set deep in her skull. Now and again, a strange evil light shone in them, and they flickered around in every direction, so that it was impossible to fix her gaze. Her head bobbed up and down. Her mouth moved rapidly, sharp and bitter. She was worse than the plague itself, I thought to myself, hence her name. Thank you. 
As you all know, uh, Svarte Daven, The Black Death, is a book work. And we thought um, we will read you one of the poems in the book. Uh, it is full of alliterations and sound imitating words, which gives it a very nice ring in Norwegian. And we'll read it. I'll read it in Norwegian. It's the poem uh, to um, the poem called Sweeping Every Corner. Super Vær Krok. Pesta soper vær en krok, slutt med raking, sope, sope, tiden er knapp, alle må med, per og pål, rubb og stubb. Pesta liker seg vær er bra, trist og mørkt, sner og sludder, smelter, siler, klisser og søler. Limen tar så det skvetter, limen soper i krik og krok, alt er trist, deilig trist, død og døde, stank og råttenskap, veggene sprekker, bjelkene råttner, bladene faller, luften gråter, sne og sludd. Yes, this poem really describes how Pesta sweeps every corner in line with the wet and wintry weather. Pesta brought bro both a broom and rake, and when she took the rake inside the house, someone would survive. But if she left the rake outside and used the broom inside, everyone living in the house would die. Yes, the book contains different elements, both texts and drawings. Text as a combination of verse and prose poems. And this drawing is a good example of how he strengthened the content in the motif by his own text. Now, Tina, maybe you could say something more about Kittelsen's technique? Yes. Uh, I'll say a few things both about Kittelsen's technique in general and also show you some uh, details from some of his uh, black dust drawings. On the screen you should now see one of the vignettes for sweeping every corner. You can here see how Kittelsen outlines his drawing in graphite pencil before he traces most of the lines with pen and black ink. For filling in, Kittelsen used a mix of, a mix of media. Wash, black crayon, black ink and graphite pencil. Uh, in this detail, you see the full page tonal drawing of sweeping every corner, where you can see that he uses wash um, sometimes as a background, like in the walls of the building. While in other instances, he uses wash uh, for a different uh, kind of effects, like in modeling the rock formations and also in creating the wet ground. In the detail on the lower left, um, you can see uh, his brush strokes and how the brush is sometimes uh, quite wet with wash and at other times drier. In the next detail, um, you can see uh, Kittilsen's use of crayon. This is still sweeping every corner. Um, here he's using a black crayon to create a different type of texture from that of the wash. It's a drier and grainier medium. Um, he also uses it to intensify some of the darker areas. He uses crayon on its own or on top of wash, um, and also sometimes in combination with pen and black ink. Now you should see a different uh, drawing on the screen. This is the drawing Pesta coming. In this drawing, uh, Kittelsen has relied more on ink lines to model uh, both the landscape and the figure of Pesta. As you can see to the left, the uh, uh, ink lines vary um, quite a bit in thickness and spacing. They have been applied in different patterns uh, with more or less pressure. And in one area, uh, you can even see marks from the pen nib. The next uh, drawing is from the poem Knut og Tore. Uh, this is a, a poem um, where the mountain tells Tore how many days are left until Christmas. And in this one, um, you can see the original drawing on the left. You can see that Kittelsen has used different inks for drawing and for writing. The drawing ink is black with a, more of a shine to it while the writing ink is brown and matter. 
the brown ink wasn't necessarily brown when it was applied. Um, it may have changed with time, we don't know. You can also see um, uh, here uh, how Kittelsen has planned the layout of this page in the book. So the original drawing is to the left and the, um, uh, the book page is to the right. And how he also added some comments to the printer or uh, publisher. In the next detail, we are back to sweeping every corner. Here you can see how, uh, uh, how Kit Ilsen uh, made the snowflakes and the sleet. So he's scraped um, away, uh, scraped away some of the uh, media uh, to make use of the paper tone for the snowflakes. And the dripping sleet is made by scratching. I'd like to show you a few more details uh, of uh, Kittel's mixed and layered technique. In this slide, on the left, you can see um, a detail of the mice in the drawing Musta. Uh, Kittelsen has used hatched uh, pen lines on top of a more even background uh, to give the effect of creeping and crawling mice. On the right, uh, you see a detail from the birds in Mother, there's an old woman coming. Here he uses wash as the basis, a graphite pencil for more depth and black pen lines on top. In uh, Pesta on the Stairs, uh, I guess his most iconic picture from the series, he's used wash as a background, fine pen lines, uh, and black crayon. And then you should uh, pay extra attention to the lighter areas because then he's used the paper tone as well as scratching um, to create the extra highlights. It gives a very nice effect. Mm. Uh, the last uh, slide with details is from Desolation. Then uh, you can see that the moon is the tone of the paper. There's an even layer of wash around it, wash co covered with black crayon in parts further away. And then again, uh, Kittilsen has used scratching to create the highlights of the moon shining on the tree. I think these drawings, um, they seem very much as finished works in their own right. Uh, I think Kittilsen has uh, put a lot of effort mm. into them. He's adapted his uh, a technique both to the atmosphere of the of the subject and mm. also to the technique of reproduction, as we'll get back to. Other illustrators would maybe have used pieces of paper to um, create mistakes, or maybe gouache or other types of um, media to create the highlights and the lighter areas. Mm. While Kit Ilsen's use of the paper tone seems like it uh, has a very subtle and beautiful effect. That's, uh, that was a bit about uh, Kit Ilsen's media and his technique. Uh, Mayfried, we should get back to its contents, shouldn't we? Yes, it was very in interesting to listen, listen to your knowledge about all these details, I think. Yes. And um, we might have a close look to one of the poems or little tales in the book about little pe uh, wee pair and little Mari, two siblings left uh, as orphans after the plague. And they were lucky because there were some trolls who, take, who took pity on and cared for them. Han vesle Per og lille Mari alene tuslet om. Alle var døde, hele bygden stod tom. Borte var det beste som de hadde på Guds jord. Pesta hadde sopt vekk både far og mor. Og trollene, de sullet og stullet for de små. Guri kom med mat til dem mens de i søvnen lå. And this poem also has its parallel in the legend about the grouse, Jostedalsripa. 
the little girl left alone at the farm Birkhaug in Jostedalen in the 14th century. And this particular story was also the theme in one of the novels by Henrik Ibsen in 1850. And let's have an even closer look at the content of these pictures. Regarding the time described earlier, it's not strange that he made this choice of subject for his next project. Experiences of death and threatening illnesses are reflected in art from that time. Christian Krog and Edvard Munch are among the artists close to Kittelsen's environment. Kittelsen worked intensively with the drawings for the Black Death throughout the years living in Wittsten. When he moved to Egedal with his family in 1896, only a few drawings remained. And Kittelsen's encounter as well with the nature in the valley of Egedal as the old farms inspire him deeply to fulfill his project. Egedal was a lonely part of the country at that time. Many farms were abandoned, as you can see on the drawing here in the background. And the dark autumn kept his imagination alive. Have a closer look at the drawings at the courtyard from Sole with the old Ramskakel of buildings. Notice the stillness and peacefulness. Kittelsen loved this place and felt at home. The open country around makes me glad and strong. And if you can have a closer look at the inscription, lower right, till Hans Orl, that's describing that uh, this drawing was a gift to young, young Hans Orl, the son of Kittelsen's old patron, Diedrich Maria Orl, who came to visit him this, at his first summer at Sole. And we know for sure that he drew the drawings for Musta and probably also Pesta on the stairs and the old church here. So this is Musta. And this is the old church with the bear lying here, sleeping in front of the altar. <coughs> yeah, but let's go back to a uh, li little bit more to his use of technique. Could you, could you say something more about his technique in the original drawings related to the reproductions in the book, Tina? Yeah. Um, as we have seen now, uh, Many of Kittelsen's drawings were made with reproduction in mind. And on the screen you should see his um, uh, first reproduce, reproduced drawing. We have this one, the original in the collection. It's called Sea Monster. It was reproduced by wood engraving and printed in 1881 in Dybvads Illustrerede Folkeaventyr. This drawing is a typical line drawing in ink. In 81, 1881, it would have been transferred to a piece of endwood mm. via a photographic uh, process, and the wood engraver would have made the incisions um, into the wood to create the printing surface. The white areas would be carved away, leaving the area to be printed in relief. By the time the black test was printed, wood engraving had mostly been replaced by other techniques in book illustration. The first edition of the black death printed in 1900 was printed by Oscar Andersen. Relief line blocks were used for the text and vignettes, while relief half tone was used for the full page reproduction of the more tonal drawings. The first edition of the Black Death has been praised for the quality of its reproductions. It's therefore interesting to see the company name Meisenbach, Riffert and Company in the lower corner of the full page tonal images in the book. You should now see this uh, signature on the screen. George Georg Meisenbach was a German engraver who invented the type of half tone process in the 1880s. Uh, his invention was based on previous methods, uh, but proved, uh, it proved to have quite a lot of commercial success. Meisenbach later merged with Heinrich Riffert, and their company became 
an important provider of reproductions and illustrations in the European market. In uh, one of the tonal drawings, we find the initials W, uh, S and Company. Uh, these are the initials for Wilhelm Scheel, Scheel who was one of uh, Christiania's biggest companies for uh, production of printing blocks. They were established in 1897. And Christiania was the old name for Oslo. On the screen you should now see a close-up of a um, uh, half-tone process. This type of reproduction is better suited for reproducing variations in tone than methods such as wood engraving or line blocks. This is because a screen was used to turn the original drawing into black and white dots photographically. As you can see on the left, the dots will vary in size and the human eye will see uh, the pattern as a range of greys. The mesh of the screen could be of different types and fineness. For instance, it could be coarser for newsprints and finer for art books. On the screen, you should now see um, uh, sweeping every corner again. Now uh, we are showing you the um, book page. Here you can see how the line drawings and the text have been reproduced using line blocks. Uh, the tonal drawing using the half tone process. If you look at the P on the upper right, you can see that it is printed as one black area. On the lower right, you can see how the half-tone screen pattern is appearing in the drawing as you look at it under magnification. It is also interesting to compare the original drawing both to the 1900 edition of the Black Death as well as to later editions. The edition from 1900 was reproduced from the original drawings uh, and it has managed to keep the nuances of the grey tones better than later facsimile reproductions. Mm. If you look at the screen now, you should see um, some details from Pesta on the Stairs. Uh, on the left, the details are from the original drawing in the middle from the 1900 edition and on the right from the 90 from a later facsimile edition you can see that the um, darker area start merging into one and also uh, the white areas are not quite as white in the facsimile edition so you start losing some detail and variation from the original drawing So now back to you, Mayfried. Yes, I should show you one of the pages, but got lost here. Yes, maybe which we can one? Maybe you can show it afterwards. Yes. Oh yeah, I'll show you the. Sorry, we were going to show. Yeah, but we were going to show the drawing compared to the original. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> it was in, in this one. Yes, sorry. <laughs> so you have the original drawing over on the stand. And, and you can compare it with the book reproduction here. Yes, and the next I'll show you one the yes. original drawings again. Another of his of the iconic motifs from the series. The pauper. The poor man left alone, ending his life in loneliness. Kittelsen certainly was a man of the people, and throughout his whole life his, his economic situation was tense. He had a deep distrust of the powerful and well-to-do people, people on the sunny side of life, so to say. His own struggle for life, for himself and his large family, probably strengthened the plague's democratic aspect in his imagination. It hit rich people as well as poor. It affected every single Norwegian. Despite the hopelessness, the pla plague implied a certain sense of solidarity. 
It made man equal in a sort of national fellowship with which he was able to identify. I don't know whether any of you are fans of the black metal culture, but there is an interesting link here. Several metal bands have chosen Kittelsen's so-called black motifs. They have in interpreted elements as satanistic and death-worshipping into their concept of idealization of the pre-Christian Norway. Anyway, none of us are experts on this. <laughs> But what they positively have in common with Kittelsen is the fascination for the macabre and the dark melancholy. Historians and experts like Svein Strömmen and Jérôme Lefebvre have made a point out of this. And you can read their interesting articles in the exhibition catalogue from Blåfavverke in 2014. We should also mention that um, Kittilsen repeated some of the motifs from the Black Death in uh, later colored uh, drawings. You can see this one. It's the Pesta from 1904. And just like he combines uh, wash with black crayon pen and pencil in the Black Death, he combines watercolor with cra colored crayons, pen and graphite pencil in his mixed media uh, colored drawings. He may have meant some of these drawings for um, to be re reproduced uh, as lithography, but he uh, never did it himself. Uh, however, after Kittilsen de Kittilsen's death in 1914, his widow Inga uh, chose four of these colored drawings for reproduction. She went to Christiania to oversee the process and control the quality, and she also signed and numbered the prints. In the autumn of 1916, uh, the first lithographs were ready for sale. Two of these were from the Black Death series. Uh, one was Desolation, the other one was the Caper Kale playing. Mm. Yes, now you have a, a family photo on the screen, I guess. <laughs> Although Kittelsen had a strong fascination for the dark and macabre, he was strongly connected to the surroundings, both his family and the scenery. And he was a family man and a beloved and caring husband, for sure. Together, he and Inga got nine children. How does this story end? Pesta is leaving. And when our new museum opens next year, you will have the opportunity to visit the study room to see these original drawings at close hand, live. We can promise you an even closer encounter with Pesta than you have had today. Yeah. Okay. okay. Then I think we have time for some questions. Yes, we do. Uh, we've gotten a lot of comments as you were talking, and we have some to ask you. Let's see. If we can find one here. Uh, can you perhaps make a comment on Andreas Faye's publication Norwegian Legends from 1833 and if it, it has any influence on Kittelsen's work with the Black Death? Um, yes, uh, we know that Kittelsen uh, was well aware of, of uh, this book with legends and it was first, uh, the first time it was published was in 1833 and we don't know for sure which which edition Kittelsen had, but, but uh, several sources tells us, uh, tells us about his, um, his inspiration from, from what he read in Faye's book. But can you, you can see it in his poems, can't you, that he retells the stories from Faye? Absolutely, as absolutely. Well as, I, uh, as, as well as some stories which are his own work, Kittelsen's own. Yes, there yeah. it's a kind of a combination. But if you're uh, directly inspiration, is uh, I showed you first the title page, then Sorte Död, and one of the legends in Faye's book has this title, 
than sort the dirt. So, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this is a detailed one. Who or how were the fonts picked for his books? Or especially the sort of dud. Do we know anything about the fonts? We don't actually no. know. Uh, it, um, it says in, uh, in the drawing, original drawing for Knut and Tore, he has, um, he has written on the drawing uh, to be typed in uh, big letters. But uh, <laughs> that's all we have from Kittelsen. We don't know how it was decided or uh, how much influence he had uh, in the end on the font. Thank you. Kittelsen's work reminds me of Goya, but also of symbolism artists of his age. I wonder if he had any other inspirations, and if so, by which artists? Yes, uh, Kittelsen lived in, in Munich as a young, young uh, artist and student for some years. And we, we know that he, he was well aware of the art of um, Böcklin, the Swiss artist. And um, I think this is um, for sure a, a source of inspiration for Kittelsen. And I think that he will have known pictures from Gustave Doré and, may, and probably also from Peter Bergel depicting uh, the Black Death. And, and as I mentioned, Böcklin, he, he made um, a famous painting that's now in the art museum in Basel called uh, the Pestile on the Plague in 1898. Thank you. Uh, does the Kittelsen house in Kragre have an extended collection of his works? Do we know that? Yeah, good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know wh wh how large the collection is in Kragre, but we, I think they have some original drawings there as well, but I should, I'm not... Uh, I'm not the right person to, to answer that question. <laughs> they probably have a homepage with information. But there are also other museums. Absolutely. That have some uh, uh, the collection at Blofarwerke, they have a nice collection of works by Kittelsen, both the drawings, paintings and uh, furnitures. Kittelsen was a, made also furnitures and interior elements. So their collection is very um, strong. And um, the, uh, his home in uh, Egidal, Laulia, where he lived for about um, 10 years with his family, is um, still kept as a, a museum. And um, even if they don't have many original drawings there, they have a lot of elements from Kittensen's life. Interior decorations, for example, in, in the house. And um, it's really worth a, a visit for those who and also come the, to the nature around it, you can you can find uh, part of what inspired him in yes. this uh, house in Egedal. In, in yes, and in the whole valley of Egedal, you can see mm -hmm. uh, mountains called Annasnatten and other parts of nature, and will, you will recognize it from from his pictures. Um, then there is a comment about the fact that there is a lot of information about Kittelsen's work as an illustrator, but not as much about him as a writer, um, because he did write the texts for the books. Mm. So why is there so little information about this? Do we know that? Yes, that's a, uh, also a good question. <laughs> and I, I think there is uh, information, but, but maybe we haven't uh, emphasised it good enough today. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but he definitely had a, a talent for writing as well as, as, as drawing. Absolutely. And, and uh, a contemporary um, fellow of uh, Kittelsen uh, said that uh, his, his texts don't need drawings and his drawings don't need text. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a... He, that his text was also appreciated uh, when the book was published in 1900. But for, for his um, previous um, books from Lofoten, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> there, it, it was meant to have a text by, by the Norwegian author Jonas Lee. 
So Kittelsen made a lot of drawings in Lofoten and waited and waited for, for the text to come from Jonas Lee. They didn't arrive, so he gave up and, and, and wrote the text himself. Thank you. Why were Kittelsen's artworks so grounded in folklore? Was it equally as popular with other artists at the time? Um, yes, uh, Kittelsen was not the only one. Seems to have been a, a general trend in a way at the time. These um, fairy tale motifs and, yes. uh, and the old Norwegian Norse uh, myths. Yes, especially in the 1890s, and mm. an artist working both in with uh, painting and, and decorative art as well. Mm. We have several examples of that, and that's one element that will be, will be um, visible in our new exhibition in our new museum, in some of the rooms. Then we have a question here. As a fan of early cinema, I feel a large influence on German expressionist cinema, such as Fritz Lang. How is Kittelsen's influence seen in Norwegian cinema? Yes, good <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> My first uh, thought then is the film uh, Trolljegan. I don't know if, if, you, if you know that, uh, that one. But I, I see Kittelsen <laughs> references to Kittelsen all the time when I saw that film. Yes, and then... Uh, Absolutely. And uh, we also have uh, two quite new films about Askeladden, the figure from the Norwegian folk tales. And, and uh, you can even there see several references to, to Kittelsen. Absolutely. Um. What is his place in universal art? Like, how well known is he in general? I, he's very known in Norway. Mm. Oh, he's but. quite quite known uh, abroad as well. We in this uh, study room during the years we have had many many visitors from different countries, from Japan, from Spain, Italy, and uh, Kittelsen is definitely the most popular art artist beside Monk. They want to, yes, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I think um, artists, other artists, as Walt Disney, was inspired by Kittelsen. And some years ago, there was a, a large exhibition in Paris uh, where Walt Disney's inspiration, source of inspiration, were exhibited, and Kittelsen was among them. Perfect. Let's see if there's a couple more here. Uh, can you say something about his work with dry pastels? Um, in general? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think uh, I've seen a lot of pastel in his works that I have seen. He uses a lot of um, crayon. Um, it could uh, crayon or colored pencil, uh, watercolor. Um, seems that seems to be the main from what I have seen. Yeah, but in in his winter mm. motifs, the the kind yeah, of happy window, yeah. winter motifs, does he use pastel there or is that crayon as well? Of that, I'm not sure. We'll have to. Uh, mm. You could, um, there may be some of his uh, works on our website, if you look in the collection. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can find some more information. Mm. Then there's a question about if there are any unpublished works of Kittelsen, and if we can see them in the new museum. Mm. Unpublished, I don't know whether uh, any of them are unknown, but, but you will definitely have the chance to, to, to uh, have a closer look at, at all his drawings. If you come to the study room, we'll, we'll find them yeah. for you. you will both, so, both the drawings and we also have some of the, uh, the first editions of some of his uh, book works. Mm. Not all, but 
some. And in the new museum, there will also be one of the rooms in the exhibition will be a fairy tale room, and and Kittelsen is definitely one of the main artists in that room. Uh, and and uh, the opening exhibition in the Gallery of Prints and Drawings will show uh, the fairy tale drawings by Kittelsen and Erik Wernschall. So come to Oslo. <laughs> Um, someone is asking about the last print you held up, which is Pesta Leaving, I believe. Can mm. you hold that up again? Um, he's commenting on the seaside motif. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, can you talk briefly about that? The, um, about the motif? Yeah. Or? Yeah, I think it's a, a kind of relief that uh, Pesta is uh, is leaving. She uh, she has done her job, <laughs> but but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at the same time as she's leaving, together with these black black birds flying away, the the um, seaside it's quite peaceful and and uh, desolated. No no other people there. So it's it's quite dark, even if she's leaving. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can. <laughs> I can't say add to it. More. I think I'd have to read. Uh, should have. You'd have to read the text that goes with the page or with the drawing. Yes, also. someone have to make an English translation of the yeah. black bat. Okay, thank you. Um, the posture of Fatiman. Uh, you had the English translation for that. Um, the, dead the posture of the dead body is phenomenal. Could the <laughs> painter have studied medical anatomy? Do we know that? <laughs> <laughs> this one? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think he, he went to any medical course, but, but I know that he, when he went at, uh, as a young student, uh, he, he went to the Teineskool in Christiania, and also in Munich, he... he um, he had an um, thing. He uh, was educated in Ed Munich Educated, as well. yes. And they w drawing anatomy was a part of that education. We also have some still life. No, we have some of the drawings, life drawings. Yes. That he did in his study time, yes, don't we? Absolutely. In the collection. Mm. Mm. It's also possible to see in the new uh, study room. Yes. How has his later association with black metal affected his legacy and contexts? Mm. <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> a tough one. Yeah, I'm not the right one. one to answer that. Uh, no. That's how the black metal has affected his legacy yeah. as an artist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it uh, has... Um, Contributed to his uh, his fame. His fame, yes. I think <laughs> yeah. we can we can say that. Yes. Um, was he famous during his lifetime, or did he become famous later? Uh, yes, the fir his first yes. Of course, he he struggled for for uh, <laughs> to be a famous. He actually wanted to be a painter because that was the upper level of the hierarchy. And, and um, when he went to Munich, it was uh, a painting called Strike, that was his f uh, debut painting. But it was first when he started to make drawings for, uh, for different uh, channels in Munich that he, he, uh, his talent was yeah, noticed. And, and uh, in his lifetime, yes, of course, he had uh, already in uh, 1900, uh, he, he was, um, his series, painting series, Surya Moria Slot, was bought for the National Gallery. And, um, and uh, these drawings from um, the Black Death was exhibited at Blomqvist in uh, 1902. So, uh, and they were, um, promoted, and the book was uh, promoted in the newspapers, the contemporary newspapers, and, and recommended as a Christmas gift. 
the same years that this was published. So uh, he definitely was mm. famous in his own time, and, and his economy was tense, as I mentioned earlier, and he, he used, often used um, picture or works of art as payment instead of money. I guess also the fact that he was asked to contribute to uh, illustrating the fairy tales is a sign that he was absolutely quite, uh, that was his uh, f the first uh, uh, sign for his uh, size yeah. as an artist absolutely okay yeah. so the last question um, that we will answer now live uh, you started talking about his private life so was there anything in his personal life that steered him towards the dark themes such as the black death Oh, so that's a complicated one, <laughs> because uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, he has a quite uh, complex mind, I think. He, he uh, was a happy, happy man, a happy family man, but he also uh, had uh, dark thoughts and saw the more depressive sides of life as well. So I think it's um, his art shows his, both these sides of his life, I think. Thank you so much to Tina and Mayfi. Um, and thank you all for watching at home. The next episode will be in March, and the topic will be announced at a later date. Our previous live streams can always be accessed through our Facebook and YouTube pages including past talks in the series with Norwegian subtitles. This series is called Close Encounters, if you want to look it up. We wish you all a good evening and thank you all for watching. <laughs>